Servetus and Calvin was now in Geneva. Servetus was still in France. He worked under an assumed name, right? He had a false name. You couldn't go around saying, oh, I'm Michael Servetus, because he had published a book against the Trinity that would be really dangerous and really rather stupid. So he had an assumed name, Michel de Villeneuve. He was practicing medicine. And in 1553, a letter reached the French Catholic authorities telling them that Michel de Villeneuve and Michael Servetus were one and the same. Now, it seems clear the letter came from Geneva, although not from Calvin himself, from another man. But the man was from Calvin's circle. So did Calvin nudge the man to say, hey, let the French authorities know that Servetus and Villeneuve are one and the same? That's not entirely clear. In any rate, the French authorities, the French Catholic authorities, arrested this doctor, Michel de Villeneuve, and tried to figure out if he and Michael Servetus were one and the same. Well, that's not easy to do in the 16th century, right? They don't have DNA tests. Um, don't have photographs. And how are you going to prove this? It's, it's really tricky. And as Michel de Villeneuve, he had established a good reputation as a physician in his town. And so in prison, he was given quite a bit of leeway. And one night, he went to the jailer and said, could I go stretch my legs in the courtyard before bed? And he was already in his dressing gown. So the jailer said, okay, that's fine. Out you go. And as soon as the jailer's back was turned, Michel de Villeneuve, alias Michael Servetus, climbed a wall and ran away in the night, still in his dressing gown. Uh, one presumes he found other clothes at one point. Um, he ran off in the night and uh, was headed out to Italy, because in Italy there were other anti-Trinitarians. Now, by running away, he had clearly shown the Catholic authorities that there was a case here. Right? You don't run away if you don't have anything to fear. It's a mistaken identity. So he ran off in the night. The Catholic authorities promptly put him on trial in absentia, condemned him, created a straw version of Servetus and set fire to that. So, Servetus knew that France was literally too hot for him, right? He's not <laughs> going to want to go back there. It is dangerous. Okay. So, you're in France. He was near Lyon, in the south uh, east corner of France. He's trying to get to Italy. If you know your geography, there are a lot of mountains in the way, okay? That's a difficult route to take. And a good land route is through Geneva. Right? You can do that quite well. From Geneva, then you take a boat, and you go over a few mountain passes, and you're going to get to Italy. So he came to Geneva, intending to stay there overnight, so he said, and leave the next day. And the next day was a Sunday. And in Geneva, on a Sunday, everybody is meant to be in church. So, the question is, what's better? Is it better to hunker down in your hotel and stay in bed? Or is it better to get up and go to church so you're less noticed? He went to church. He was recognized, and he was promptly arrested. Now. Here's the problem. You think, okay, why did they arrest him in Geneva? You'd think that in that case, he hadn't said anything in Geneva, that, that really the Genevan authorities should handle this case in a different way. As far as you know, if someone commits a crime, okay, I'm Canadian, say I commit a crime in Canada and I get arrested in the States, what usually happens next? Extradition, extradition right? You're going to extradite me back to Canada to face the judges there. Servetus begged on bended knee not to be returned to France. He knew that if he went back to France, he would be condemned. So the trial was going to take place in Geneva. Now you might say, well, why put him on trial at all? Why not just let him go? He didn't say anything in Geneva, just, you know, just let him go. Any idea why that might not be such a good idea from the Genevans' point of view? What were they worried about, do you think? What would happen if they let him go? They look soft. That's right. The, the other churches will turn around and say, look at those Genevans, they even let arch heretics go that the Catholics would have condemned, they let them go free. And you have to understand very clearly that heresy in the 16th century was not viewed as an individual viewpoint. It was viewed as something contagious. Not just your view, but it's catching to other people. So, if I have a particular view, I will spread it to others, and they will get it, and they will spread it, and things will go from bad to worse. Calvin served as witness for the prosecution with the other pastors. A long court case between Calvin and Servetus and his colleagues. Now, some people have suggested that Servetus himself did not have a great grasp on reality, and that Servetus himself thought that somehow he would be able to defeat Calvin, and that Calvin would be put in jail, and Servetus would be vindicated. That would, to my mind, be a highly unlikely in terms of the theology of, of, of what they were each arguing for. This time again, the Genevan city authorities wrote off to the other Swiss cities, asked to say what should be done with him, and this time the letters came back unanimously that he should die. Because anti, believing in anti, that the Christ was not divine was such a 
rejection of central Christian doctrine, that in the 16th century this was not acceptable to anyone. Servetus was eventually charged and uh, condemned on the charge of blasphemy and was executed in October of 1553. Calvin had asked for his execution to be more humane, that he be hanged or had his head chopped off. Instead, he was burned alive. Um, execution by fire, by water, or by burying alive were the standard penalties for heresy and blasphemy. It's a cleansing, right? Fire cleanses, water cleanses, the earth cleanses. Um, and uh, you know, this is, this is what happened to Servetus. Now, clearly, this is still something people are very upset about. If you look at the last ones on your page, we get a fair number of emails at Calvin College. And some of them range from a reasonable conversation starter. Mention should be made as Calvin's flaw as a man of God and that he did not show love for neighbor. To, do you take pride in having your college, college af named after a mass murderer? Um, mass murderer was that sort of an elite, but never mind. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's just... In some instances, you can have a conversation. In other instances, you can't. The people writing to you are not into a conversation. They are into just sort of saying their, their piece, and they don't really want to discuss it. Clearly, what happened to Servetus today would not at all be acceptable in any way, shape, or form. But we, I don't think, can revisit the past and make it be what we want it to be. We cannot take our 21st century mindset and say that people in the 16th century had to live the way we would live. Now, that doesn't mean that we excuse him. That doesn't mean that we say that I was the right thing to do in all circumstances for all times. But we have to understand the past in its own terms. We can certainly say it was regrettable, that it was you know, a terrible thing to have happen. But in the mindset of the 16th century, it was unfortunate but had to be done. And that's not to say that today this is right, or that in any circumstances today this would be acceptable. But in the history of the 16th century, certainly what Calvin did was um, part of a wider problem of the emphasis being put on true belief, first and foremost, and questions being raised if you advocated something that was, that was considered false belief.